I ask you guys a really quick question first? When was Rhode Island Providence Plantation founded? What year? 1636. 1636. Thanks. So think about the end here. When it was established, 1665. Right? 1665. So 1636. We have the English here talking to us, telling us the way that we're going to rule this new land. And do uh, you want the cynic and skeptic in me today, or do you want the four walls kind of thing? Because I see Charlie, and I see a lot of these people, and they're working very hard. They're working very hard to change things. Connie and her group are working very hard. But they've created such a bureaucracy there that I just don't know how they're going to really untangle it unless we get involved. So as I was sitting there and I watched uh, Mr. Fogren walk out and Mr. Mollusk walk out, all I could think about was a columnist sitting in a place like this, way back when, listening to everybody talk about how things are going to work, and saying, no, you don't understand. They don't work this way, guys. We don't want it to work this way. So this is why I wore this jacket today. <laughs> and I can see the settlers that they took off their jackets and they said, thank God the Brits left. <laughs> because think about it, South County of Rhode Island, just in itself, was a bunch of people who were mavericks. The whole state was full of mavericks, full of people that were dreamers, and full of people that could just actually do it, that were deliberate enough to make it happen. And Connie talks about, yes, Connie, we've taken you up on a bunch of different things from the um, Rhode Island Department of Labor we have, but it's a pain in the neck. It really is a pain in the neck. We've hired five new people. Anybody in this room that's a business leader, when you need people and you finally find that quintessential person that fits the bill, are you going to call the DLT and say, can I get my $5,000 and I have to fill out the forms? And it takes a week or so for approval, right? It takes a week or so. I don't have a week or so to wait because I have customers that need the product. And I'm just happy as heck. Are you guys happy when you finally find somebody that fits the bill for a spot? Because at the end of the day, I see Steve here, at the end of the day, there's nobody to do it. Who's going to do it? You. You're going to do it. Any business leader, you're going to have to do it because the organizations that we have down here in Southern Rhode Island are small organizations. And Rhode Island is full of small organizations. And the business owners, business leaders have to roll up their sleeves and do it. We have to do it. So the first thing, you know, as I said, listen, and they're working hard, but they need to hear more from us. I'll stand back here so everybody can see it. Government must understand the voice of the customer. We're the customers. We need to understand what we're doing because in our businesses, if we don't listen to our customers, what happens to our business, Steve? The buses stop and the people stop and you have thousands of lobsters and nobody to eat them. Right? So you have to bend over backwards. And, it, and, it's, and it's a time now, what I see from the time, just the small pieces that I get to see on EDC and from the prior governor and the current governor, Governor Chafee, that have allowed me to meet with these people and see it. These guys have tough jobs. I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus. They have tough jobs because the bureaucracy has gotten so tangled, so complex, that they've lost sight of what are we doing in this small state. So you hear that what Charlie's doing and Ralph Mollis are doing are trying to detangle it, but they don't get enough insight and feedback from us as business owners because we've become cynics and skeptics. We've given up. You know, they talk about the governors you were asking about the percentages. I'm saying, great, there's 0 0.03, 0 0.6, whatever it is. And I can go to my office and find out from HR how much it is. But it's a tax on us. It better go away by what Charlie says. It better go away. Because too many times, what happens is a tax gets bestowed on us as business people. And people kind of forget about it. You know, it's like the direct TV or the thing that comes off your credit card. And you say, I lost my credit card. Why am I still getting billed? I told you I didn't do that. How did these people find my new credit card number? And the tax will still be there. The governor's workforce board grant money is our money, guys. How many of you guys know that that's our money? Does anybody, you guys realize that that's our money? That's another tax from 1985? Connie, anybody here remember 1985? <laughs> you guys know that? That money that they're giving away, and that money equates to, I think at this point, 12 to 20 million dollars sitting up there on Smith Hill. 12, right? Somewhere in there, I'm not going to hold somebody. 12 to 20 million dollars. And they had a freeze on it for a bunch of years. And the House and the Senate and some
government wanted to put a budget gap and do a pullback of that money. We had a big rally up there about that money's our money. The money was set aside. It's an extra uh, percentage that we pay that goes back to us and that we all have access to. So, you know, this is important for us to take advantage of these things because if we don't control what's in our four walls, that's what I was here to speak to you guys about today. The first thing is we have to control what's inside our businesses. If we can't control what's inside our businesses, then we can't do anything else. That's the mainstay for our community within the four walls of Charlestown. It's the mainstay within South County. And then it's the mainstay within Rhode Island. And Rhode Island has some really neat things that are happening because Mr. Mollis was talking about how they, they are the repository for information in the state. It's unbelievable. And, and they have to have that information because they want to charge people taxes. They want to collect all the fees and different things. And the EDC that I've sat on, I'll pass this book around. The last time they had a book out, 1975. And it might be 80. But I have this one from 1975. I'll pass it around. And this was from manufacturing. And I know that some of these people might not be in manufacturing, might be in the service industry. But where is there one stop in the state that you can go and find out who's who in Rhode Island? Does anybody know one place you can go and find out if you want to look up people in Rhode Island? There's no place. Maybe Providence Business News. Maybe Providence Business News. I'll pass this around and you guys can look at it. Because the quandary now that's happened with EDC is that when people call, an EDC should be the first stop for businesses to kind of figure out how to get to county, how to get to DLT, how to get to the Secretary of State. So we need to tap into the Secretary of State's database. And he's talking about this big computer. And how many people have computers here? Can I see a show of hands? And everybody has a computer. Does a computer do what you want it to do all the time? No. No. Not at all. Uh, you know, my computer, is, and it's usually the nut behind the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opposite problem because we're all human, right? So Mr. Mollis has started this nice software package and doing all this stuff, which is great. I commend the heck out of it. But can it talk to EDC? Can it talk to DLT? Can we share information? Because you hear the term big data. Well, Rhode Island's full of big data. The big data is just stuff in the computer that different people want to extract. And this is what happens here. This is what happens in the state. Because the subcommittee that I work on at EDC is Office of Regulatory Reform. And this was, this is a legislative bill back in 2010. I can't remember the day the bill was. But it was to take a look at all the regulatory activities that we have in our state that hamper business because we feel overregulated, we feel overburdened, and it just stops us. So in Rhode Island right now, we have 74 regulatory entities. 74 for a state by 36 by 39 miles. And some of them aren't even really, you wouldn't even know they're around. We have 1,638 regulations, and there are 133 in the pipeline. So you figure that, 1,638 is a lot of regulations. And Office of Regulatory Reform is trying to get all the different departments to look at their top 20% that affect business. And how do we do it? But they need help from everybody in the agency because some regulations were actually policies. They weren't even regulated. They are just policies because the regulation was never written clearly enough. So rather than somebody doing the wrong thing, they put in all these policies to make sure that the regulation got followed. So this is, this is we have basically, I think it's 16 really big stovepipes of regulations, and they're silos. And what happens in a silo, guys, things go vertically up and down in a silo. It's like an elevator shaft. Things can flow up and down. The guy at the top usually knows who's in the middle and the bottom, and the people in the middle know who's at the top and who's at the bottom. And he can figure out who it is. It's like the kid yelling from upstairs in the bedroom, Ma, can you get Dad? And she yells down to the basement, Dad, somebody wants you on the third floor, right? He can figure it out. But if Dad's at two neighbors down the street, the kid can't yell vertically up and down, and we can't find information. So this is what happens. Are you following with me on that example? So this is what happens. We as customers 
We travel horizontally through all these silos. And we're all different businesses here that need to stop at different regulatory agencies. So what happens is DLT, the Secretary of State, DEM, they're all understanding that they have, they're counter-dependent on each other. And information and people flow through them. So what happens here is DLT hands off to DEM or Department of Health or, uh, you know, uh, DBR or uh, General Treasurer's Office, the information that gets handed off, they don't hand it off properly and properly. They don't know how to. They don't have computer systems. They don't have paper. They don't understand how counterdependent. And as we travel through from one to the other, if they don't have a good streamlined process, it all falls apart. It all falls apart. So the better these guys know and understand how we work, the better they understand how each agency works, the better services they can do for us. Yes, we all? And, you know, it's, and I have EDC on there because this is a presentation that, you know, was, was critical to us as board members just to see what they were about. And each EDC board member, I, I suggested this a while ago, is that each EDC board member, and even business leaders like yourselves in this room, should have somebody be a mentor to a state agency and mutually learn together and have conversations about what bugs you, right? A lot of stuff bugs you, I'm sure, every day, Connie. A lot of stuff bugs me, but how do you get it fixed? Well, that's what I like about going out and visiting, because we can get that feedback, yeah. you know, from the businesses. And it's, and it's, and, but then you need the speed internally, too, because business owners, any one of us here, if we tell somebody something, how quick do we want a response? Tomorrow. Yesterday. <laughs> and it's hard in your agency. So that's one disconnect. And our expectation is here, when we tell Connie, or we tell Mr. Fogarty, we tell them we want something, we expect it yesterday or sooner than yesterday. And the agencies don't work that way. You know, they just don't work that way. So the key thing is, inside the four walls that I was going to start on, is that within Rhode Island, EDC is working really, really hard. And I'm glad I saw Mr. Mollusk here. Because Monday we have an open meeting at 8 a.m. at EDC. And you guys should come to some of these open meetings. So watch what goes on. You can sit there. You can't, you can't speak at the meeting, but you can sit and watch what goes on. And we're looking at a new software package to have an EDC so at least they know who they're talking to and what the different businesses in Rhode Island want. And then the other big, the big caveat was I said, great, we're going to do this, but will it talk to everybody else? We need to talk to Brian. We need to talk to URI. We need to talk to... Johnson & Wales, we need to have business people be able to talk to it. So we're trying to get something so these guys look more like businesses like we do. If we don't know who our contacts are and what different people want and do this kind of stuff, it's not happening. It's not happening. And, and we need to know the businesses. They couldn't tell you how many businesses called there now. And it's not a fault of them, it's a fault of the system that they were built on that no one was really held accountable. And what I mean by accountable is that we don't go, I see my friend Eric saying, we don't go to Eric at 5 o'clock and say, Eric, you didn't do it. Accountable means that Eric understands what he has to do during the day, and he manages the database to help all of us. You know? And we have to participate in that and help out. We've found so many vendors. We manufacture 1,350 different products, guys. We have about 100 people in our organization. We deal with 190,000 people globally. We're open from 7.30 in the morning until 8 o'clock at night answering phone calls live. Live. No auto attendant, no voicemail, no one has voicemail. And we're not going to get back. People want it now. I want it now. So the expectation is that. So when we do things like this, speed is critical, right? And the flexibility of what we've had to do in our organization. We could have gone to India, we could have gone to China, we could have sourced product anywhere in the globe. Anywhere in the globe. And we decided to stick with Rhode Island and New England vendors. We decided to stick to people that we can get in the car and drive if they have a problem or if we need something really fast that we have a relationship, we pay a little bit more money, but we work with them too on trying to drive down the cost, just like we need to work with 
DLT, Secretary of State, to drive down the cost of Rhode Island. That's what's crushing us. The cost of a lot of the services is crushing us because we don't understand the customer outcome that we want. We've built a big silo around this. It's not simple. It's not elegant, right? So with sticking inside our four, four walls, getting local vendors, we're so competitive globally right now because the whole supply chain around the world, around us right now, China, India, how many people get stuff from overseas here? Anybody? So what's happened overseas? Can you get the stuff like you used to? Right? Eric, can you get the stuff? This young lady, can you get the stuff? Thank God I have people around. I can drive down the street. And I can drive down and say, hey, I need my stuff now. Because I have a customer on the other end doing this, and I can look him in the face and say, I need it. And if he has any empathy and understands the relationship that through the economic downturn, I stuck with you, I paid you, do it now if we're going to grow. You got it. Right. You got it. So think, we've found two vendors in the last two months, and I've done a national search a national search for a product that I've been looking for. It's a special switch that I could only find in Germany. Where else did we find? Switch All over the globe except the U.S. Except for the U.S. I'd be pulling my hair out. Then I'd send them emails, and I'd wait a day to get an email back. And then they wouldn't understand what the hell I wanted. And I was like, this is just, this is just nuts. A year, a year and a half, right? Well, <coughs> guess what? And he gets on the computer one day and says, Carl, these guys are in, where were they? Rhode Island, Providence. Rhode Island, Providence. Reservoir Island, Providence. Reservoir Island, Providence. <laughs> Isn't this what you were looking for? <laughs> and I said, they don't make it. They don't make it. <laughs> you guys just have it on their website. I will guarantee you they do not make this. So I called the guy up and I said, this is Carl Pfeiffer. I need to get some of these things. I said, you guys actually make them? He goes, hell yes, we do. I said, you make them here? Hell no, we don't. So I said, that's great. Tower Manufacturing. Here's this little sleeper company. They have 1,500 employees in China. 1,500 that moved away from Rhode Island to China because they couldn't compete here in this state. They're the global market leader in this special switch that I wanted. They private label for Lowe's, Home Depot, for all the air conditioning. The ground fault interrupt. Have you ever seen these big switches that they have on electrical appliances now? instead of the GFI breaker. Mm -hmm. These guys are the lead. They're the best. Their engineering department there blew me away. Blew us away. We went up, sat there, and I said, where have you guys been? He said, Carl, we can make you whatever you want. We can put your stuff on it. And I'd never get that if I had to go to Europe or anywhere else. I'd just be another number. And the quantities of what I'm going to buy are a couple thousand. This guy's selling millions, and I'm happy that he's sitting at the conference room table, another Rhode Islander, willing to help us. Then we're looking for these crazy straps. We wanted, you know, like the backpack strap, but we need them for safety harnesses for equipment. The guy's in one socket. He's next to CVS headquarters. This little company, and he makes all the straps globally for militaries all over the world. So Rhode Island has really, really profound things. So when you hear different people, and even Governor Chafee, talk about all the cool things we're up. He gets to travel the state and meet these little companies, but how do we share that information with Eric that may be looking with some, for something, with you that may be looking for something, and Rhode Island companies that can get us out of it, because we declared our independence through what? Rhode Islanders making it happen, right? So if we're going to get out of an economic downturn that we have now, it needs to be Rhode Islanders <coughs> making it happen with the platform that these guys are setting us up for. That's all they're doing, they're setting a platform for us. And the design of their platform is only as good as the information that they get back from us. And not, not, not information that is judgmental or confrontational, because it's not going to get us anywhere. It has to be factual information, not assumptions or opinions. We have to give them facts of why things don't work, show them how it is. Bring them down there. Bring them down to Nordic Lodge and show them what a short order cook needs to be. And let them stand behind you and see how quick they need to react. I heard you talk about um, finding young people. You have the same thing. It's not young people. It's any people. Right? It's any people. But it boils down to values and characteristics. What Kanye and DLT are doing are great things to understand that people know tools. But any one of our businesses 
Are you willing to hire people for their values and characteristics or what they know? Yes or no? First one. Well, what they know. Well, I mean, well, the first one is valuable oh, characteristics. Doesn't matter. You can teach anything. You can teach almost anything, exactly. But if they have the right values and characteristics, so DLT, you know, I started in with with Mr. Fogarty and and Connie here a long time ago, saying this website kind of doesn't do what we need it to do, and your stuff, and they're doing good stuff. I don't want to seem like a real pessimist and cynic. They're doing great stuff. But we need to peel away the layers of the people that we're looking for values and characteristics. And Deborah Guest sat, I've sat down, I've met with her only once, sat down with her. She's the commissioner of education. And I was blown away that she has a big overarching umbrella. She doesn't control the cities and towns. All she does is can send out a mandate. Did you guys know that? She could just send out a mandate because I said, Deborah, why can't you? She goes, I see all this stuff, but she's not the supreme omnipotent leader for Chattahoe. She's not the supreme omnipotent leader for Exeter, West Greenwich, East Greenwich, North Smithfield. She just sets a big target. And then I said, well, how do you break down the walls so you're more collaborative, working with these school departments, working with the business community? And I was shocked at how little, she has very little authority, right? She comes comes under fire like nobody's business. And I'm saying, why are you under fire? You can't do it. She can't do much of anything. Am I correct in my assumption? Yes, you are. It blew me away. So that's my talk. Sorry if I rambled. Sorry if I rambled.